Oxyhalogenation of alkenes is a useful reaction that makes halohydrins from alkenes, adding a halide and a hydroxyl group to our substrate in a single synthetic procedure. Its mechanism is similar to halogenation and, just like halogenation, it is stereospecific as well, giving the anti product where the OH and the halide are looking in the opposite directions. Hi everyone, my name is Victor and I help students excel in organic chemistry by explaining difficult topics in a clear and straightforward way. So grab your cup of coffee and a notebook to work through the examples with me and let's get started. We are going to begin with the generic alkene reacting with the Br2 molecule. In this case, the alkene is going to be playing a role of a nucleophile, so the electrons from alkene going to go onto the bromine, the bond between bromines is going to break, and one of the electron pairs on my original bromine that is accepting electron density from the alkene is going to attack one of my carbons back. So the first step is exactly the same as in a regular halogenation reaction. As a result of this electrophilic attack, we are going to get a three-membered ring, the halonium ion, which is going to be fairly electrophilic on its own as well. So the next step is going to be the nucleophilic attack. And the nucleophile here can be either the Br- or it can be water because we are doing the reaction of hydrohalogenation, so we are doing this reaction typically in excess of water. So, which one is going to be our nucleophile? In this particular case, it happens to be water. So, water is going to come in, attack one of our carbons, and open the halonium ion, giving us the next intermediate, looking like this. And you might be wondering, why are we doing the nucleophilic attack from water rather than Br-? Wouldn't a negatively charged species be a better nucleophile? Well, technically, yes, you are correct. A negatively charged species, especially species with larger orbitals like Br-, usually are much more nucleophilic than neutral species like water. However, in this case, we are playing against statistics. Or maybe I should say statistics plays with us, because what happens here is that water is present in a significantly larger quantity than the Br-. When we are doing reaction like that, obviously not every single molecule is going to go into the reaction immediately. So in reality, the overall concentration of Br- is going to be quite minuscule. And if we are using water in excess to begin with, now, in comparison to the minuscule concentration of Br-, the concentration of water is just gargantuan. So water is going to be the most statistically likely nucleophile to be present next to our halonium ion, so water is going to be doing the attacking. And now, when we got our protonated intermediate, we are going to do the last step in which we are going to be using using water again as a base now to deprotonate it and return a neutral product to the system. So here I'm going to use water, grab one of those protons, giving me a halohydrin final product looking like this. Also, occasionally one other version that you can see is that some textbooks and some instructors are going to use the Br-, which we formed in the first step as a base, and using Br- to pull that proton off. While technically it's statistically unlikely to happen and water is more basic than Br-, it is not really super incorrect to do it like this, and if that's the way your instructor wants to do it, well, I guess you can write Br- as your conjugate base that is doing deprotonation. Because at the end of the day, we are going to form a co-product in this reaction, and the co-product here is going to be HBr. So if we did want to show how we are forming this co-product, we might as well use Br- as a conjugate base, although, as I've mentioned, it's statistically unlikely to happen, and water is significantly more basic than Br-. So now, when we know the basics of this mechanism, let's look at the real example. Here, I have an alkene reacting with Br2 in the presence of water. And although we are not normally going to be saying that water is present in excess, it is in excess, and usually we are talking about at least 10 to 50 times more than the uh, bromine electrophile here. So like we have just seen in our generic mechanism, the first step in this reaction is going to be the electrophilic attack from bromine onto our alkene, so the electrons of alkene going to go onto the bromine, the bond between bromines going to break open, and 
MD, a regional bromine is going to back attack one of the carbons of the alkene. That is going to give me an intermediate looking like this if the bromine attacks from the front face of my uh, molecule. And of course, if we are attacking from the back face of the molecule, then my uh, intermediate is going to look with the bromine facing in the opposite direction like this. Now, from this point on, again, we are going to have the Br- present, but that Br- is going to be present in a very small concentration, and we are going to have a great excess of water, so I'm going to show the molecule of water next to both of my intermediates, so I can show the nucleophilic attack on each. In the first case, we are going to be attacking here, and in the second case, we are going to be attacking in the same position as well. Remember that whenever you have a three-membered ring with a heteroatom like bromine, oxygen, mercury, doesn't matter what the heteroatom is, whenever you have that three-membered ring with a plus, you're always going to be attacking from the more substituted side. So in this case, if we look at our uh, halonium ion, I have atoms A and B, and atom A is more substituted, it has more stuff around it than atom B. So the attack by the nucleophile is going to happen from the more substituted side, just like in the case of the halogenation reaction. With the only difference is that now we are not attacking it with X minus, with Br minus in this case, but rather we are attacking it with water. As a result of this nucleophilic attack, we are going to open our halonium ion and get the protonated intermediate like this, which after we get rid of our extra protons, so I am going to use my water molecule again in the first case to pull my proton like this, and for the uh, intermediate on the right, I will write H2O nearby as well. I will grab that proton and get rid of that proton as well. So as a result, we're going to get our final product in both cases looking like this. I'm going to have halohydrine A on the left, and I'm going to have halohydrine B on the right. So those are my final products in this reaction, and in this particular case, they are going to be enantiomers to each other. Also, like in the halogenation reaction, due to the nature of this mechanism, this is going to be a strict anti-addition where my halogen, bromine here, and the OH group are going to be anti to each other, or trans to each other, so to speak, and I'm going to see the same situation in the other product as well. So remember that this reaction is strictly an anti-addition, so you're never going to see your OH and bromine on the same side, unless of course you are rotating molecule around and you're making a different conformation, but originally they are always going to be anti to each other. And also, because this reaction is highly regioselective, meaning that the bromine is going to end up on the less substituted carbon and the the oxygen is going to end up on the more substituted carbon, sometimes people say that it follows the Markovnikov rule, giving you so-called Markovnikov product, where, as I've mentioned, OH is going to end up on the more substituted carbon, while the halide, bromine in this case, is going to end up on the less substituted carbon. And although it is a little bit of a stretch to call it an actual Markovnikov product, that is the way some instructors and textbooks call it, so uh, if you hear uh, somebody calling this reaction following the Markovnikov rule or giving you the Markovnikov product, that, that's what I mean by that. And of course, just like halogenation doesn't always give you a pair of enantiomers, oxyhalogenation can give you enantiomers or diastereomers as well. So for instance, if I react this cyclic alkene uh, with my bromine in the presence of water, then what I'm going to end up with is going to be a pair of diastereomers. But don't just trust my word, let's work through this problem together. So step number one is going to be the electrophilic attack from my bromine onto my alkene. So I'm going to show my Br2 like so next to my alkene, and I know that step number one is going to be alkene attack, electrons between bromines go to one of them, and my original bromine re-attacking my alkene. So I'm going to end up with two intermediates, two halonium ions, one where the bromine atom is looking at me, and another one where the bromine atom is looking away. Next, I'm going to perform my nucleophilic attack, remembering to invert the configuration of the atom where I'm doing the attacking, so water is going to attack over here, this is the more substituted atom, 
which going to open the halonium ion from the left side and the same story for the other one which means that in the both cases I'm going to end up with a protonated intermediate that looks like that which after I deprotonate that with another equivalent of water so I'm going to show that another equivalent of water is going to come up and is going to pull this proton here and I'm going to reuse my water. I will show that another equivalent can come up and pull my proton like this. So in this case, I'm going to end up with a pair of stereoisomers looking like so and the stereochemical relationship between these two molecules here is going to be diastereomers. So as you can see, this reaction is fairly straightforward. It gives you an important synthetic target that we can later use in various other transformations. And the only two things that you have to keep in mind when uh, doing this reaction is regioselectivity, meaning that the OH is going to end up on the more substituted carbon, while the X is going to end up on the less substituted carbon. And of course, by X here, I mean the halide of some sort. And the other fact that you need to keep in mind that this reaction is an anti-addition that results in your OH and your halide looking in the opposite directions from each other. So my OH and bromine are always going to end up looking in the opposite direction, one on dash, one on the wedge, or the other way around. Thank you for watching this video. I want to especially thank all the Organic Chemistry Tutor members and my generous donors. I upload new videos every single day and this would not be possible without your help and encouragement. If you learned something new today, please give this video a like, leave a comment below so YouTube algorithm will promote this video and show it to more people. And in the meantime, watch this video next and I'll see you tomorrow.